From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. During the pandemic, our outdoor areas became even more important as safe and healthy places where people can gather and recreate. Last November, Portland voters overwhelmingly passed a five year parks operating levy. Since the city's Parks Bureau was in a deep financial hole, that support from voters has been called a lifeline for the future of the parks. In this episode of Straight Talk, we look ahead to what's next for Portland Parks. And as things open up again, what programs are available as we look forward to summer? Welcome to my guest, Portland City Commissioner Carmen Rubio, who joined the council in January as the first Latinx council member. Among her portfolio of bureaus, she heads up Portland Parks. Also joining us, the Portland Parks Bureau Director, Adina Long. She was hired by the late Commissioner Nick Fish and started as the head of the city's parks in February of 2019. Welcome to Straight Talk. It's nice to have you both here. Thank, Thank you for having me. me. You know, this has been such a tough year for everyone. What role do you think that Portland's parks and nature trails played during the pandemic? And let's begin with Commissioner Rubio. Well, COVID's really uh, uplifted the huge role and importance in parks and, and nature to people's physical and mental well-being. The isolation, being cut off from the routine of life, including friends and family, really takes a toll. And I saw this firsthand in my work uh, before coming to council and definitely seeing it, seeing it on a broader scale as well. And parks is a place that provides that respite among the uncertainty. And parks was critical for people's and is critical for people's health and well-being during this pandemic. Uh, people who live in places with little or no ac access to green spaces, families with children, they all take refuge in a park or a natural area. And it's a critical infrastructure for, for all of us and one that is for everyone to use regardless of where you live. And this pandemic has reminded us all how necessary it is to all of our lives. And Director Long, how much do you think the pandemic really highlighted how important parks are to Portlanders? Well, I believe that Portlanders have always appreciated their neighborhood parks and natural areas like Powell Butte and Forest Park. But when the pandemic closed movie theaters, restaurants and other indoor activities, our parks became a real salvation for many Portlanders. People just flocked to our parks over the last year. Kids needed places to run, play and explore. Portlanders of all ages needed to get out of the house to improve their physical and mental health. And our parks provided a safe way to do that. I really want to appreciate Portlanders for using their park system safely over the last year. People physically distanced and wore face coverings when public health experts explained the benefits. And the vast majority of Portlanders adapted to those preventative behaviors quickly. Parks are critical public infrastructure and COVID-19 reminded us all how necessary they are for us all. And director, the park system was already in a big financial hole with a six million dollar plus shortfall. The pandemic really only made things worse. What financial impact did the pandemic have on our parks? Well, as you know, the Parks Bureau, under the leadership of the late former Parks Commissioner Nick Fish, had already begun the work of balancing our budget and creating a sustainable future for our park system. This included painful cuts, but the Bureau was prepared to meet our budget goals. Then COVID hit and changed everyone's world. COVID forced us to close our community centers and we had to lay off or not hire around a thousand people. It was a huge blow. Well, voters really came to the rescue. In November, voters passed the five-year levy, which will mean about $48 million a year for the Parks Bureau. The levy will cost the median homeowner about $13 a month. Uh, Commissioner Rubio, how important was the passage of that measure to the future of the city's parks? Well, it was very important because as you know, uh, the former business model was based on earning fees from, from programs like swim lessons and Zumba classes. And that fee revenue made up a significant part of the park's budget. Um, and so to you know protect public health, we had to close down community centers and pools during COVID, um, but also with the buildings closed, the fees that the bureaus relied on stopped coming in and it created a, a, a really harsh effect um, that we lost revenue. So we realized that we'd be losing the opportunity um, over this next year, but thankfully the voters recognized the value of these services and um, in, invested and in, in restoring a lot of these services as well. 
And uh, COVID's impact on the Parks Bureau meant that without the this new source of funding um, that the levy provided, the Bureau would not likely to be able to open pools or restore all of our recreation programming for a significant amount of time. So um, we're very grateful for this opportunity. And Commissioner, ordinarily those funds from the levy wouldn't be available for a while, not till later this year or next year, but you were able to come up with a win for the parks. What did you do? Yes, so you're correct. So the levy um, was passed in November 2020 and the resources typically would not become available until November 2021. But we didn't want Portlanders to experience another summer without access to the programs that we need and we love. Uh, so the moment the Bureau knew the levy passed, they began to work on a plan to advance some of those resources early on so that we could provide programming in 2021. And so city council approved a loan between city funds that uh, that uh, I requested so that we could meet our promise to the community of restoring programming during this very important moment in time, um, which is this summer. And the bureau is also ramping up to be ready to utilize more resources in November. So we're just getting going and the city will be uh, will see amazing work from Portland Parks and Recreation in the coming years. And Director Long, from your point of view, what has that meant for the park summer program this year, getting that money early? It means we're going to have summer again. I mean, with safety always top of mind, but we're restoring summer programs and meeting our promise to voters. We'll mostly be outside this summer with day camps, sports, nature exploration, and ecological restoration programs, and of course, splash pads, fountains, and swimming. Uh, we'll also be offering fitness classes in parks. There's going to be something for all ages and abilities. Well, Commissioner Rubio, we've seen more and more people get vaccinated. Give us an idea. What does summer look like for the parks and parks programs? What can people expect? Set our expectations. Well, they can expect, um, as, as uh, Director Long stated, they, they can expect summer to be back. Um, as we work with safety as our top priority in that frame. Um, parks will offer mostly outdoor programming, um, but these summer programs were designed to be flexible. So if COVID-19 continues to diminish, um, as we're, we're all hopeful of seeing, uh, and the staffing is robust enough, we can, we can grow and possibly expand more programs and add them as we, as we go. And if for some reason the risk to public health goes back up again, we can still have the ability uh, to uh, safely have programs outdoors um, on a continual basis. So it'll be an evolution, but we will definitely still have summer. The levy is also designed to center on equity and access to the parks. Director Long, what does that mean in practice? We know all Portlanders haven't had access to parks and recreation the same way. Uh, one barrier to access has been the cost of programs. We won't let cost be a barrier to take part in what the Bureau offers as it has been to people earning low incomes. So for summer 2021, we have a pay what you can model. It allows folks to choose what they can pay for programs when they register. The goal is to improve access for people who haven't been able to take part in parks and recreation programs, programs that we know will support their physical and mental health. We are working with culturally specific and community-based organizations to better understand their needs and their priorities. And we are increasing maintenance in parts with equity guiding us. And again, we are only able to do this because of the community's investment in the parks levy. We were talking about uh, pools and summer programs. So I wanna show people where they can get more information, all seven indoor and outdoor pools open Tuesday, June 22nd. If you're interested, you can find a schedule on this web page, portland.gov parks slash summer. So you can see it there and find out the schedule. And you talked about fountains and splash pads, Director Long. You know, what does it mean to people to have these splash pads open again and the pools? Well, uh, we are all super excited that pools will reopen uh, for some programming this summer, thanks to levy funds. We designed this swim program in stages because we just didn't know what the public health landscape would be when we had to actually make the plans. Uh, Portland Parks and Recreation will have swim lessons, which we know saves lives. And witness, uh, we'll also have water fitness classes for Portlanders to get and stay healthy. We expect to be able to offer a small number of open play swim sessions. Staff are working on that now and we will have more information in the coming days and weeks. We'll start out. Go ahead. We'll start out conservatively 
And if the community continues to trend in the right direction with COVID, we'll continue hiring and staff and uh, expand programming as we can. Well, let's talk a little bit about the staffing because there has been so much uncertainty. It, it must have taken a lot of planning months in advance, not really knowing what to expect for summer. Commissioner Rubio, how tough has it been to ramp up staffing? It's an ongoing process um, and we're still encouraging people to apply to work, work with us. Um, but when COVID hit, parks had to lay off or not hire about a thousand people. And that, that means as we're ramping up from a dramatically uh, scaled down workforce, um, that's, that's quite an effort to step up. But we expect to hire nearly uh, 1,900 people this summer. And we're expecting a shortage of lifeguards, which is actually part of the natural, national trend that we're seeing. So we're still very encouraging of people, all Portlanders, to come join the Portland Parks and Recreation team. And you know, I just have to say that planning during a pandemic isn't easy. Um, and safety must remain our top priority. So I really give a lot of credit to the Parks Bureau and Director Long and her team for, um, for really um, uh, reacclimating and recalibrating as we go uh, in doing so very efficiently. And Director Long, the park's summer of free for all, free lunch and play has been so important to many young Portlanders who rely on free and reduced lunch during the school year. Tell us a little bit about how critical that program is and what we can expect this summer. Well, you can expect that the free lunch and play program returns. We're really excited to continue this critical city service, which we've offered without exception for decades. Um, hunger and food insecurity will remain, pub will remain public health needs as, um, even as COVID diminishes. So we expect to again serve about 100,000 meals for families this summer, filling the gap when school is out for summer. And the program also comes with free, fun games and activities. Uh, we're working with area school districts and other hunger relief partners to finalize park locations and schedules. So that information will be available soon as well. Commissioner, uh, East Portland has felt neglected for a long time, and I know East Portland has really been a priority for you. You have plans to develop Mill Park on Southeast 117th Avenue and Mill Court. Tell us about some of the plans for the park and what does it mean to East Portland? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, East Portland does not yet have the same access to parks or green spaces as other parts of the city, as, as you know, Laurel, and, and something that we've all talked about um, quite a bit. So I have directed Portland Parks and Recreation to build out Mill Park. Um, and it's been something that has been, uh, you know, been in the, in, the, in the planning works for quite a while. Um, and it will be developed with wonderful new features, including a new pit playground, a community garden, splash pad, and many other amenities. And I'm eager to see Portland Parks Re Recreation partner with the area's um, diverse communities uh, to create a much needed signature park for the Mill Park neighborhood. Uh, and the neighbors are so excited to have been waiting for this for a very long time. Uh, the park is next door to an elementary school that welcomes children who speak over 30 different languages. Um, so uh, developing Mill Park is key to continue working to serve the needs of East Portland and its growth. And Parks has invested more than 84 million in East Portland parks since 2013. So uh, we're very excited about this progress. The passage of the levy also included creation of a civilian oversight committee to review expenditures. Has that work started? Let me ask uh, Director Long. Yes, uh, Laurel, it has started. Uh, we uh, accepted uh, applications in May and we'll be selecting the oversight committee members uh, this month. And we anticipate that they will be meeting uh, this summer uh, uh, to start their work um, at overseeing the, the, uh, the levy implementation. And I want to give you the opportunity, Director Long, for a final message for our viewers about the parks this summer. Great. Well, I just want to, you know, remind everyone that, you know, the pandemic has made clear the huge role and importance of Portland parks, recreation and nature to all Portlanders. We closed community centers and pools and we lost revenue that threatened to keep them closed for a really long time. But we are so grateful that Portlanders made a new investment in their community park and recreation system. And the park levy just shows how much people and how much Portlanders love their parks. And now we can look forward to summer again. And we are so grateful to the community and Portlanders willingness to invest in their parks at a time when it is needed most. 
So I just want to wish everyone a wonderful, safe summer, and I'll see you in the parks. And we are all looking forward to a, a fun and safe summer. Thank you so much, Director Long and Commissioner Rubio for joining us. And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Portland City Commissioner Carmen Rubio. We'll talk about some of the biggest issues facing Portland, including the spike in gun violence and homelessness. We're back in two minutes. Hello and welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. A new DHM research poll commissioned by the Oregonian and Oregon Live showed a lot of Portlanders are pessimistic about the future of downtown. Another poll showed a majority aren't happy with the way city council has handled the homeless crisis. Meantime, gun violence in the city is spiking to record levels. Welcome back to Portland City Commissioner Carmen Rubio to talk about these critical issues. Once again, Commissioner, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Laurel. Let's begin with the spike in gun violence, a really critical issue to the city and residents. Portland's on track for the most homicides in one year in the city's history. How would you describe what is going on here, Commissioner, and is the council doing enough to curb the violence? You know, I agree that this is devastating and any loss of life, any injury from gun violence is too many and too much. And in, and in that frame, uh, all of these losses are very devastating. And the question we should be asking is, are we doing the right things? Um, and we're combating gun violence with a new perspective that centers community, um, that applies a public health lens, that works um, in tandem with law enforcement, that also looks at de-escalation and, and rethinks what first responders look like. Um, we're also really committed to working with our jurisdictional partners on this issue to better leverage and strengthen our efforts. And you know, Portland, this is this is part of a national trend, unfortunately. Um, Portland, in a national context, um, is experiencing things um, that it, you know that that we're seeing um, across the country right now in big, medium, and small communities um, that that is happening during this pandemic. Um, and here at home, we've tried to shift and expand the frame for how we respond and to use more tools and a holistic approach rooted in public health and community safety. The commissioner, uh, let, have been, let me just ask you, the city council cut the police bureau's budget last year by about 15 million and again, another 3 million in the most recent budget. There are a lot of citizens who are asking, is it the right time to be cutting funding for police when we're seeing a record number of homicides? Well, I think that what we're doing right now is building in supports that are trying new things. This budget actually um, has some key components in it that enables us to have the oversight committee to um, some uh, new mechanisms that are coming forward. We also have investments in commun community-based organizations and approaches. Um, we're also in the middle of a pandemic. So I feel like right now, we're you know, it's all hands on deck and we're using the tools and the resources that we have um, in an economic, um, you know, challenge time to do uh, what we need to do in the best we can. Let's talk about downtown. We've seen more destruction and vandalism downtown and a number of businesses say they tell us they're on the brink and, and may have to close and they're begging for more support from the city. What's the city council doing to respond to their concerns? We all hear this concern and we all definitely share this concern. You know, we all want a vibrant downtown. Um, and I'm also very excited that, uh, you know, recently we're now um, having our restaurants and businesses um, on their way towards um, a full reopening. Um, and our downtown is very important for being a central community gathering place um, for also, you know, the, 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 um, a lot of the economic um, engine of, the, of our city um, is part of downtown where Portlanders go to work. Um, and where people come to experience all that our city has to offer in terms of arts and culture and other pieces as well. So we do need to focus and invest in downtown. Um, I feel like this, um, the, the federal uh, recovery funds that are coming into our city are going to be a critical um, mechanism for us to reinvesting and making sure that we're supporting small businesses and that we're supporting those vital places that keep the Portland economy going. Um, I also 
feel like we should be doing, and we are uh, very aligned around this about as a council to encourage uh, people to patronize businesses in the downtown core, um, but and also support those small neighborhoods um, as well as well as the downtown core. Part of the pessimism among respondents to the Oregonian poll revolved around the homeless crisis as we've seen a surge in campers downtown. And the city said it's more aggressively clearing camps after a pause because of the pandemic. But many have wondered where will campers go? Commissioner Ryan announced this week he'll present a plan to council next week on building six managed villages across the city for people who are homeless. Commissioner Rubio, is that an idea you think that you'll support? I, I do, I will support that. Um, I believe that uh, Commissioner Ryan um, has been very thoughtful in his approach and I want to commend him for his leadership um, on this issue and on housing issues as well. Um, he's conven convened uh, cross bureau working groups, um, not only just to streamline the permitting process and housing, but he has also convened the Streets to Stability Task Force. Um, and this is, a uh, uh, a really important convening and centering uh, body that actually deliberates and, and pulls council um, uh, offices together to really look at the, the issues and to have an aligned approach. And so we're all benefiting from this streamlined approach um, and working to navigate uh, these complex issues with his leadership. And so, um, yes, so I'm very supportive um, and I'll be working uh, closely with Commissioner Ryan. Any thoughts where you would or wouldn't want those six villages to be built? You know, um, right now, I, I don't know that they're at the place, um, or at least uh, we're not, uh, we, yeah, I don't know that that part has been discussed um, thoroughly at this point. We're still creating the framework. And actually, um, he's doing a lot of work to build this out and, um, so, uh, but that is a good question and one that I'm going to be very engaged in. Um, as you know, uh, just maybe, I think it was a month ago or, or a month plus ago, you know, we uh, passed the shelter to housing continuum, um, or I, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the shelter to housing continuum um, that's made this possible. And uh, we, as part of that work, um, are identifying, we're all responsible as council members to identify within our bureaus any uh, properties that could be considered for projects such as these. So um, we, uh, I, I know that um, bureaus are, are working on those lists internally and are going to, um, you know, uh, submit them to Commissioner Ryan and his team. And so um, I'll be eagerly awaiting the next steps on that project. Well, it sounds like we'll have a lot of information coming uh, perhaps in the coming weeks. We only have just over a minute left, but I wanted to ask you about other than what we've talked about, your top priority or our final message for our viewers before we have to go just over a minute left. Sure. Well, I would just love to say as Portland's Arts and Culture Commissioner um, that I'm also keenly aware of among the other topics that we discussed today of just how challenging the last 15 months has been for our arts and culture community and our artists. So um, once you're able to safely or and you're vaccinated and, and, or um, being safe, um, I really encourage um, Portlanders to make your reopening plans and encourage you to, to include some live events or arts events um, in your schedule. Um, we're very lucky to live in the city that we do that has uh, so many um, artistic opportunities uh, to enjoy. So let's get out there and support the arts community. I have to ask you, we have uh, maybe 20, 30 seconds left, but how would you describe your feeling about the future of the city right now? You know, I uh, believe in Portland. I've lived here um, or in, in the area uh, for nearly the entirety of my life. And I believe in Portlanders and I know our economy will come back. And uh, we, uh, you know, we're a unique city. Um, and we're innovative and we're creative and we're resilient. So I believe in us. Commissioner Carmen Rubio, thank you so much for joining us. And our thanks once again to Parks Director Adina Long from our first segment. Thank you for watching and listening. Remember, you can get Straight Talk as a podcast wherever you get your podcast. Search for KGW Straight Talk. Join us next week when we talk one-on-one -on -one with New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristoff. 
He invited us out to his family's farm in Yamhill. We talk about the struggles of people he grew up with in Yamhill and how it's a reflection of what's happening across much of working class America. We also talk about his New York Times column, Lessons for America from a Weird Portland. Join us next week for Straight Talk. We hope you have a great week.